Hey everyone, I'm Matt Cremona. And I'm Matthew Morris, and today we're here in Mike Pekovich's shop. We're gonna take a shop tour. Mike, why don't you take us away? Hey guys, uh, good to see you again. Um, I'm Mike Pekovich, welcome to my shop. Uh, what uh, we're looking here now is probably the most photogenic corner of my shop. Um, I work for Fine Woodworking Magazine. I do a fair amount of video work and photography in this shop, and so, in essence, this is sort of like the, the TV set where there's one corner that looks pretty nice. The rest of the corner is not so nice, but I'll give you a, a peek there. Um, this is my hand tool corner. This is, you know, obviously I got lots of machines. I do all my milling, uh, surfacing, a lot of joinery on those machines. But when I get to my workbench, uh, for me, this is where the woodworking really starts. Um, I've got a pretty small workbench. It's only about five feet long, uh, two feet wide, but it's... Uh, I have a small shop, so I think the two sort of fit each other. And behind me is my um, wall hanging tool cabinet. I built this as a project uh, a couple years back, I think. So um, if you're looking for a tool cabinet design, find woodworking.com. Um, you can get some plans there if you want to take a look. Uh, um, I get teased to a certain extent at the office about sort of having too many hand tools. Um, I don't think I have a lot. I, in fact, I, I don't have a lot that, um, that I don't use. Um, I do have a couple sort of planes that act as a decoration up on top of the cabinet. Um, other than that, everything in, in the cabinet is, is, is pretty much good to go. Um, What's your favorite, Mike? That's a horrible question. It's like, <laughs> it's like asking Rob Cosman, you know, what's his favorite kid? How could you do that? <laughs> this is true. He's got, I think, nine of them. Uh, you know, it, it's funny. Um, you know, in, in terms of the tools I really like, uh, you know, I reach for a lot, obviously, uh, Lee Nielsen low angle block plane, uh, my six inch Starrett combination square, uh, my Lee Nielsen number four bronze smoothing plane is probably the first plane I, I pick up unless I know it's dull and something else is a little bit sharper. Um, those, that's probably... You know, that's, um, those are the big guys. I just got a, um, probably a, a new marking gauge is probably the most recent uh, uh, addition to, um, to my tool arsenal. This is actually made by Bob Van Dyke who runs the school, uh, Connecticut Valley Woodworking in Manchester. He makes these for the school and it's a really awesome marking gauge. And so whenever I teach there for a week, I'll use all of his gauges um, and get used to using it. And then I get back at my shop and I don't have it. And I'm really bummed out. Uh, he finally made one for me. So this is probably, you know, my all time favorite tool of this week anyway. Um, in fact, I, I talked him into writing an article on making these. So um, hopefully uh, if you want one just like it, uh, you'll be able to make one as well. Um, is there anything in your cabinet that you made? Um, I have a couple wooden hand planes, a couple Krenov style planes. Um, this was the first plane I made. It actually started out quite a bit longer, but this wood ended up not being tremendously stable. So every time the bottom warped, I would flatten it and cut off the ends until now it's about seven inches long. So it's either like a giant block plane or a small smoothing plane with a really thick hawk iron. Um, so it's really great as a one-handed plane uh, for detail work. Um, it also takes uh, really, really nice shavings. And the second plane I made is the same style, but it has a, a cambered sole to it. So I actually made this plane uh, for a commission on doing sort of a, uh, it was a bed where the headboard and footboard were uh, made from coopered panels. So. I made this plane specifically to plane that uh, the inside face of those curved panels. So that was really cool is to sort of have an excuse to make a tool for a specific job. And it's not something I need to pull out every now and then, but that's probably, um, it's, it's, it's a really cool tool because of that. And then I'd probably say the other uh, tool I really, really like, um, and it's one I use quite a bit. It's just a really, it's a short, uh, wide chisel. Um, this thing is over an inch, maybe inch and a quarter. Um, I use this 
almost as often as I use a block plane and I use it almost in the same way I use a block plane. I keep it really, really sharp. I never do any chopping with it, but I do it for, I use it for fleshing pegs or knocking off corners. Um, it's a really nice precision tool. So um, I think that's probably, you know, one of my favorite tools as well. And um, below the workbench uh, or my tool cabinet is a rolling tool chest. This is my travel chest. Um, it's not as big as my cabinet, so I can't fit all the tools in there, but this is what I load up when I go on the road to teach. And if, especially if I'm somewhere for a week, um, it's really nice to have my own planes, my own chisels, saws, uh, my own sharpening stones. So this little guy is definitely my home away from home. So that's, um, that's always nice uh, to travel with. So you built yourself more room to store more tools. I don't see a problem with that. I, I see I see no negatives to that situation, so I, I don't think I'm going to dignify that with a response. <laughs> okay, so is your is your bench in the shot as well? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah the, the the bench top of my bench. What you can't see on my bench is um, a drawer box that's built inside the bench, which of course has lots of tools in it. Um, but the one really cool thing about the bench is along the window on the back edge of the bench. Is, um, is a rack where I've got, oh, maybe 20 or 30 chisels all lined up there. So rather than having to um, open up a drawer or open up a tool chest to get my chisels, they all live um, right where I'm working. And that's really cool because that, what that means is I'll pick it up, I'll use it, I'll put it right back in the rack, as opposed to picking up a tool that stays on the bench until my whole bench is just littered with tools and I have to like clean everything up to find a, a little uh, a little bench space to do some more work on. You just recently built a new bench. Well, I don't know how recent it was. It was the videos were recent on fine woodworking. So, and you've got this bench here. If you were going to do something new in the shop, would you add a feature, or subtract a feature to your bench? Um, yeah, we just did sort of like a, a shaker style workbench. You know, it's a cabinet style bench uh, with a big top on it. Um, I would definitely. Uh, the only thing I would change about this bench, ideally I would like a, a longer bench. Um, I would keep this base and I've really been uh, wanting to, and you just reminded me of it, so that's cool. But my next shop project is to make a new top for this bench. Uh, this bench is just uh, eight quarter um, maple boards uh, on their face. So the top is less than two inches thick and it's pretty short, again, about five feet. It has just cast iron vices. Um, I would like a little thicker bench top, a little bit longer, maybe a six foot bench top. And I really like the Lee Nielsen twin screw vices. Um, they're at a lot of schools I teach at. I get spoiled when I use those. We put one of those on the bench uh, for the project. And um, they're just really, really great because with the two screws, you can clamp your work in between them. You don't have to worry about the vice racking and all that kind of stuff. So that would be a nice luxury for me is a little thicker, a little longer bench top and um, a new vice on there. But, um, you know, it's like one of those things where it's like, would that be really cool to have? Yeah, that'd be really cool. Is it cool enough for me to have gotten around to do it yet? No, it's not. So, you know, um, it's, it's still on my wish list. I hear you. Build furniture or build a new bench? Or get a new segment and cutter head for my old planer. You know, I think that would be, you know, that, yeah, that would be my, uh, that would be my over under right there. But you know, the minute that I save up enough to get a new segmented cutter head, you know, I need new tires for the car or you know, the toilet breaks or something like that. So priorities. So um, so that's the clean part of the shop. What's the rest of the shop look like? <laughs> uh, well, let me, uh, let me bring the camera around and I'll, I'll uh, uh, we'll just look at the ugly truth of it. Hold on a sec. All right, so this is the, um, not so photogenic corner of the shop. Um, uh, and actually it's sort of a, a better peek at some of the machine work, uh, machines I've got going on here. Probably my newest purchase is a 17 inch bandsaw. It's a grizzly bandsaw, I really like it a lot. It replaced a 14 inch Delta, which I got um, in my first generation of machinery. So right out of college. The good thing about the program where I studied in college is that all the machines weren't big industrial machines. They were sort of um, smaller size machines with the intent that 
you know, when you go out in the field and, and try to sort of stake a claim as a furniture maker, you're probably only going to be able to afford this level of machine. So that's what we're going to teach you on. So it started with a 14 inch bandsaw. I've upgraded to a 17 inch bandsaw. I have a little uh, really rock solid 13 inch uh, Rockwell Delta planer. Uh, it's a RC33. Um, it's probably, you know, it's like the grandfather of the modern benchtop planer. Uh, it's only 13 inches wide, but the thing weighs about 450 pounds to move around. So it's a real beast. Um, it's an old planer, but um, it's really great. And this, I would like to uh, stick a seg segmented cutter head in this in one of these days. And I think it would be probably like the perfect machine. I've got an eight inch Delta jointer. I got that at the same time with everything. And it's not in the shot right now, but I have a 10 inch Delta Unisaw table saw. So although they're all about um, uh, 30 years old or so, I, I hate it when young staffers come over to my shop and they say, wow, look at all your vintage machinery. It's like, no, I bought that brand new. That's new stuff, my son. Um, one of the, uh, the actually truly old pieces of machinery in my shop is a really awesome Buffalo drill press. Uh, this actually belonged to a neighbor of ours uh, when I was growing up as a kid. It ended up in my dad's garage. So it's, it's one of the machines that I literally grew up using and uh, it still works well. I replaced the chuck on it a couple years back, but uh, the paint's peeling and the belt wobbles when you turn it on. But it's just a really, just a great piece of machinery. Uh, I really enjoy using that. Um, I don't think it's in the shot. Um, I've got a, for dust collection, I used to just be sort of a broom and dustpan guy and finally said, you know, this is kind of stupid. Um, so I have a jet uh, dust collector that I have hooked up to my planer and my table saw. Those are the real offenders. I have a small canister style shop back that's hooked up to my bandsaw. Um, and I've got another little shop back that's uh, auto activated with my chop saw. So really for me, dust collection while a whole, fully ducted system with a cyclone would be really cool. For me, it's kind of a, a divide and conquer kind of a thing. It's not a production shop. I'm not running tons and tons of lumber through it. I bring a batch in, I, I mill it up in just a day or two, and then I get to furniture making. So um, really for me, all I need is, is, is kind of a part-time hodgepodge uh, dust collection system. And this is working pretty well for me. Um, this corner behind me, while it doesn't look like it, this is one of my major lumber storage areas in my shop. It's a really small shop. And one of the concessions I had to make in, um, in sort of rebuilding it was just, it's just too small to, to have long-term lumber storage in here. So really, except for some odds and ends and off cuts, um, uh, I store all of my lumber at the lumber yard um, you know, I buy it as projects um, come in and I need it, but I just don't have the storage. I've got some green stuff out back, stickered under a tarp. Um, that's about it. So I'd say if, if I, a wish list would be maybe some sort of outbuilding where I could get serious about storing some really nice lumber. Um, and that's about it from this corner. Uh, let me move the camera one more time and I'll show you sort of the, the remaining corner of the shop. And uh, it doesn't get any prettier, but I got some other machinery in those corners as well. Do you guys have any questions while we're sort of facing this direction here? No, I'm just loving the drill press. I think it looks great. It's got a ton of character to it. And... Yeah, you talk about sort of the, the romance of hand tools. I think, you know, you know old iron is, is pretty cool as well. So, um, yeah, so let me move the camera. Um, I have an older lathe as well, and I'll show you the rest of my uh, machine work. Okay, so here is um, roughly the last corner of my shop. Uh, we're continuing on with the uh, unphotogenic uh, portion of the shop. Um, I think we can see my chop saw in the foreground. It's just a, it's a Bosch 12 inch chop saw. Ideally, I would like a, like a 10 inch slider just for its capacity and it cuts a little bit better. But those things can take up a lot of space out from the wall. So um, this one cuts well enough. Uh, next to it is a little Delta Rockwell lathe, which is plenty big for table legs and stuff. I mainly just turn drawer poles for the most, most part. 
Um, I went through a phase of turning Harry Potter wands for when my daughter was in elementary school. Um, in fact, I still have her suggested uh, wand design recommendations. This is sort of like the wand style sheet. Matt, I'll let you borrow this. You're going to need this in a few years, I think. <clears throat> um, my shop is, is really small, and the way I, I make it work is that um, wherever I need in-feed and out-feed clearances, whether it's a joiner, the table saw, the band saw, those are all situated in the center of the room, so I have at least eight feet of in-feed and out-feed clearance. The planer is raised up over my out-feed table and my joiner so I can get all my stock across that way. And for my chop saw, um, it's high enough to clear the base of my drill press. And for the lathe, I have an extra little uh, support block I can, I can wedge underneath the bed of my lathe uh, to let me cut really, really long stock on there as well. So, um, yeah, so even though it's a small shop, the important thing is, can you get long lumber in? Can you get it situated to machine it and run it and cut it efficiently? And um, the answer is, yeah, just be a little strategic about it. Um, what I've also got in this corner, uh, a little shop back hooked up to my chop saw. Um, uh, in this corner is my heater. It's a wall-mounted uh, direct vent propane heater. What that means is that there's a vent to the outside is drawing cold air into the combustion chamber, doing its thing and throwing it back out. So we're not bringing any uh, dust into the combustion chamber and we're not exhausting any whatever propane after effects of the burning into the shop so it doesn't affect humidity it keeps it um, if anything it keeps it on the dry side so i keep some water on top of it um, with the shop really really insulated i have uh, two layers of rigid insulation in the walls and the floor um, the expanding foam insulation in the rafters so um, it, I go through maybe a, in a cold winter, a, a tank and a half uh, for the whole winter. And I keep my shop about, you know, 60 degrees or so, really, really comfortable. So um, it's nice. It's a great place to be. It's actually probably one of the most comfortable places in the house because our old house is definitely not insulated as well as my shop is. Um, oh, and this just little lumber rack, again, it's... Uh, it's not a lot, but this is probably about the maximum lumber that's in here in between projects. And uh, when I do start a big project, I've got a lot of stuff in here and I tend to bust it up as quickly as possible. Um, and then just over on the other side of me, definitely one of my favorite tools. Uh, it's a Powermatic hollow chisel mortiser. And I started off drilling and chopping my mortises from there, I graduated to a little benchtop mortiser, uh, which was problematic to say the least. Uh, this floor standing mortiser, what's really nice is it's got a XY table that the stock clamps to, and then I can move the table side to side to cut my mortises and it stays clamped really firmly. Um, that to me is one of those <clears throat> breakthrough moments in woodworking, is that if you get to the point where your mortises are easier to cut than your tenons, then woodworking becomes really, really easy because it's always seemed to be the, uh, the other way around. Table saw tenon, no problem, but mortise or drill and chop all day long. But um, so that was definitely a breakthrough moment. Um, not sure what else we can see above my head. I don't know if we can see it. I do have one of those big sort of uh, hanging filters that just circulates the air around the room. Um, it's really good. I try to do as little hand sanding as possible, but that thing in a small shop just really throws a lot of dust up into the air pretty quickly, especially in the winter time when everything's closed up tight. And I do find that uh, that box fan does a really good job of clearing the air really, really quickly. And uh, that, you know, pretty much keeps everything, you know, fairly clean and dust free. Um, and it might be worth uh, moving the camera just to see my last corner. So this is the last corner of the shop. We're sort of coming back around to just about where we started. My uh, tool cabinet is just off to this side here. And 
This is basically the area right behind my table saw where I've got all my jigs, a uh, few crosscut sleds, um, dovetail jig, and um, a little box here that has a bunch of table saw blades, some of my bigger routers. I got some smaller routers in a drawer, uh, tons and tons of inserts for um, just about every blade that I have. This is a really cool, really small but heavy duty Clayton uh, benchtop spindle sander. It's not one of those tools that I use very often, but you know, but when you need it, it just works really, really well on fairing inside curves on patterns and stuff. So, um, you know, I would say any other tool that I used, not quite as often. I may not think of it as being really necessary in a shop, but for a tool that does its job that well, you know, I'm, I'm glad to make space for it. And it's really sitting on a cabinet full of drawers. Um, this is a thing I banged together really, really quick, but it's got uh, 15 drawers, which really holds a lot of hardware screws, uh, a lot of hand power tools, a lot of sharpening gear, a lot of miscellaneous stuff, all of my um, nail guns and such and odds and ends. This is um, really, really useful to have lots of drawers because in a shop, um, for storage space in a shop, uh, surface area is actually more important than like volume of storage area. So if you can take a big space and divide that up with a bunch of drawers, you can fit way more into that area than you could with a single door there. They'd all get piled on the bottom and there'd be all that dead space, that empty air up above it. So drawers are, are really, really cool. These are down and dirty drawers. They're just screwed together, rabbited plywood sides. Um, the cleats are screwed to plywood boxes. And there's actually continuous grain drawer fronts going across all 15 drawers. The way I did that is I just had these really long boards that I screwed to all the drawer fronts and just got out my circ saw and I just cut them apart, you know, between the drawers and it turned into like continuous grain drawer fronts. So I haven't tried that on a real piece of furniture yet, but maybe one day I will. Uh, so over here, um, above that, this basically represents my sharpening area. Um, I use a Tormex slow speed grinder to grind all my primary bevels on my chisels and plane irons. I use, I have a set of Norton water stones. I have a set of Shapton water stones that I use, uh, sometimes interchangeably to hone the micro bevel on my chisels and uh, plane irons. I use honing guides. Um, I've been using that inexpensive side clamping guide for all my plain irons. Uh, Veritas has come out with a, a little side clamping attachment for their high-end uh, honing guide, their Mark II, I guess, which is awesome for chisels. I've been using that. And Lee Nielsen has come out with a really nice brand new side clamping guide um, that I use for plain irons. That's my new favorite honing guide. It works really, really well. Um, some cabinets from odds and ends. I have a, a full length shelf sitting a, a foot or so below um, the ceiling. It's really just long term storage, more clutter than anything else. This is a really useful, this is a little tool tote that I made in seventh grade shop class. It has my M on the side for Mike. I subdivided it for all my square head screws. So I use this almost on a daily basis and whenever I pull it down, you can't see it, but the grade is still on the bottom and I got an A minus on it and I'm still kind of ticked off about the A minus and uh, I think it, it drives me to do better. So I think if I am a perfectionist at all in my work, it's because of the A minus on my screw tote. So There you go. So that's my shop. Um, uh, thanks for joining me. Awesome. So again, Mike, if people want to find you, where can they find you? You know, give me a ring at Find Woodworking Magazine at mpekovic at taunton.com. Check out my Instagram feed at Pekovich Woodworks uh, or head on over to my website at pekovichwoodworks.com. Thank you so much for spending the time today with us. And uh, you can find everything I do over at 
uh, mmwoodstudio.com and you Matt? You can find me and everything I do over at mattcremona.com. Well, uh, thanks for joining me. It's been a blast talking to you guys and uh, good luck with everything. And as always, please subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends, and we'll see you guys in a few more weeks with our next episode of The Matt and Matthew Show.